So welcome to my talk today on uh, what do you do with an idea? It's a product development story. Uh, I understand that several people have joined from uh, different time zones. Hopefully this doesn't put you to sleep or if it does, then you can hang on to it till the, till the end because I am going to be uh, telling a story, a real story. Right. Um, the inspiration for this talk comes from a book called um, What Do You Do With An Idea? It's a series, so you get what do you do with a problem um, and what do you do with so-and-so. Um, it's written by Kobe Yamada and illustrated by May Bessem. Bessem. Uh, I'll be using a lot of those illustrations through my slide to say this story. Um, it's really about how do you get children to think about idea, their thoughts, and how do they uh, translate and articulate that into something more tangible and what can they do with that. This was a gift from my cousin to my um, uh, daughter, um, but I have to say I have benefited a lot by reading this story, and I hope I can share that um, with you when talking about some of the product development experiences that I have had in the last two years. Um, what is very important to actually focus here is that this is not just limited to kids. In fact, the story itself, the author itself says that this is not limited to um, uh, just kids, right? And you'll see more of why. I want to use this to tell a story of one of the um, products that I built for my previous um, company. Um, but by me no means am I saying that this is the only way to go about developing a product or a product idea. There are many ways, there are tons of books written on this subject, but I hope I can share some of my experience with you all today. Um, and again, this is not limited to just product ideas. It could be, you know, an idea for a conference talk. It could be an idea for how do you want to refurbish your room? This applies to any kind of thought that comes into your mind. So what um, happens to your idea? So it could be a big thing, it could be a brave thing, smart thing, silly things, good things. It could be things like um, stories, artwork, journeys, inventions, anything, right? Everything you see around you has been an idea at some point. So what will become of your idea? So now that's entirely up to you. I am Gayatri Taharajan. I'm a senior um, engineering manager. I'm at the moment with um, Amazon AWS, uh, managing the MSK service team. But I have 17 years of background doing various projects. I come from Java engineering background. I was a software engineer at one point. Shamefully, I'm no longer um, hands-on, but um, that has helped me to kind of expand my uh, experience around product development, but mainly focusing on engineering management. I'm a huge evangelist of domain-driven design um, uh, and the principles that go with it. I have worked and delivered a lot of projects successfully employing those principles. Um, in my last um, uh, experience working for Expedia Group, um, where I spent four years building and delivering a lot of data products and data platforms, I got experience and taste in building new products and new platform ideas and uh, scaling that up across the company. So this story is about one of those, um, uh, one such experience. So an idea comes about out of necessity normally, right? So when you have a need, you think of an idea or something to solve for this. The need in this case, um, the example that I'm choosing to talk through my experience is to have something, it could be an application, a script, a tool that provides a means to check and ensure the data that we were gathering and collecting and capturing across um, our company was of the highest quality. So this need was not just identified by me um, personally. So the idea came up when during one of our brainstorming sessions and one of, um, you know, senior executive was asking, like, what do we have um, that solves for this problem? And it turned out that we didn't have a solution that particularly captured this, this need. Um, so this 
you know, is, is a good example of how the idea or the need itself may not actually come from you, but how do you take uh, a starter for this idea and how do you build up on that? Let's, let's uh, look into that. At this point, so you have a starter for an idea that's come about from, from others or from yourself. It piques your curiosity. Um, on the face of it, it might be a very simple ask. Like I said, it could be, you know, just an ask for a tool or a script or just a document that um, solves for the need. But it almost feels like a common sense. Like, you know, you ask yourself, why do we not have something that already solves for it? Again, at this stage, you the idea that solves for this need starts forming in your mind while you're talking about this, while you're brainstorming around this. It gets you excited. The whole thing builds itself in your mind, the possibilities, the opportunities, you know, even the recognition. So you kind of get carried away all in your own head, right? At the same time, your idea is not fully matured. It's entirely inside your head. It feels strange. It's very fragile. It's not really tangible. So as this is not matured and it's very much in your head, um, it might look weird. And sometimes you have this doubt. You find it very hard to believe that this could be something that could be big, that could be in the production, that could be working at scale, solving for other people's problems as well as yours. So you turn it around in your head. You're not confident enough. You're not confident to encourage this any further. And you're content to actually keep this in your head and leave it there. You try about this, you, um, you know, you think about walking away from it because you can't imagine this, you know, taking off or getting bigger. You basically don't know what to do with it at this point. And you also have this question like, what would others say about my idea? Do you hide it? Do you keep it to yourself? The answer is no. So you bring it out into the open. So the first step is to share it with others. So now let's look at how the idea to come up with a solution to solve this data quality problem came about. So how was that brought out into the open? Some um, uh, ideas around how we can do this. So the first step is you create a space for this idea where it can be opened up for collaboration, where um, the idea is discoverable, where it's open, it's written down, and everyone can see it. So some thoughts about um, uh, some examples is, you know, you start to create by, uh, you start to have like a confluence page or a wiki space, where you start adding some structure to this idea, you start to throw everything in. And as we go through how that idea builds up, that space would start to build up as well. But this is also a point where everybody um, kind of converges and uh, collaborates. The other, other place um, that falls into this category is a GitHub repository, right? So once you start to build this um, tool, you need to have a, a place where, you know, your engineers can collaborate, where your um, team can get together and start writing code and collaborate over that as well. So these are some examples of where you're creating the space for your idea. The next step is give an identity, give an identity to what was actually un up until that time was purely in your head. This could be something implicit or instinctive, right? So your first instinct is to call this uh, a data quality tool or just data quality, right? It's very common sense, very easy to, to understand, but you'll find that it's very generic as well. Um, there are other ideas around, um, I'm gonna be using the word idea a lot, it's a cliche, uh, I guess, but pun not, not intended here. Um, running out of uh, uh, words synonymous to ideas to use, uh, but bear with me. So some examples um, uh, or you know, you can use acronyms that kind of make sense to a very small set of people. So if you're building something within your organization, that makes sense to kind of align yourself with how the other products have been um, named. 
for example, call this EGDQ, which nobody outside of the company would actually make any sense out of. But we also attempted to uh, kind of name it out of Greek gods and, you know, Roman uh, phrases and, and so on. Um, well, I spent ages actually looking for some fancy, uh, you know, nice romantic name. Um, we had a poll with the team and everything, but we came up with the idea of Polaris. So the tricky thing about, you know, giving such a name is that there were like half a dozen products within the company which was named Polaris and not to mention, you know, a dozen more outside as well. And I kept on explaining to everybody like why it was named Polaris. It was supposed to be like a North Star for what a good quality data looked like. So that's what our tool was solving for. And then at some point I realized, you know, if I'm actually constantly explaining, the, the name is actually not adding any value. So we totally dumped that name and fell back to an acronym. But some acronyms kind of naturally make sense, like, you know, EC2, which is Elastic uh, Compute, or um, S3, which is Simple Storage uh, or something. So mm -hmm. th these things kind of click, but always give some identity that resonates with your customers, with your team, with your stakeholders, and um, stays there. And so where you don't have to constantly explain and is not confused with anything else. So second, the, the third point here is add a rally cry, right? So any idea that is out in the open needs a vision. So vision here is what um, you intend for this idea to become. It's very much future looking. You're not constrained by anything. It's really the art of what is possible here. And you build that vision, you articulate that vision when you put that idea out in the open followed by mission. So a mission is where you're uh, saying, what, you, what is your idea set out to solve? And um, you, know, you can draw that out into a problem statement. You can add all the scenarios that it covers, your, your product or the idea covers. It can lead to business benefit, but this is basically what you or have set out to solve. This captures the need for the product. And when you're writing down this mission statement, and I'd say that this is like the first thing that you put in that space that you create for your idea, highlight and make the keywords jump. So for example, um, if you look at this, this is an example for what a um, vision could, could be. Very simple, not too many, too many words here. Um, and here's an example for what a mission statement could be. Um, look like. And this is slightly more wordy, but as I mentioned, as you highlight these keywords, they pop out and makes it more clear of what is actually important and what is the core um, aspect of your idea. The next thing that you can add to this space when you bring this idea out in the open is what we called architecture. But, you know, this is basically an infographic of that represents how your mission is going to be um, achieved, right? So this is more a um, combination of the word marketing and architecture. So it's not too technical like an architecture diagram tends to be, but at the same time, it's uh, pleasing to the eye. It captures the key parts of um, appealing to both your technical as well as non-technical um, audience. Uh, to give you an example, so this is something that we use where you're setting out what the phases of um, uh, the, the problem that we are solving here and how we are solving it from end to end. Um, so this can invite more questions of, um, uh, you know, from the stakeholders, from the customers, uh, and they also understand in this one diagram what your product is going to do and how it's going to do. So the next part is, um, you know, know your customers. So as part of bringing your idea out in the open, you go and talk to your customers, right? So who are your target audience? Who are you building this for? Who has the pressing need? So as you go and do this, it's um, very important at this stage that you're not gathering requirements. So you're really understanding the customer segments. What is their present challenge? What do they use 
to actually solve those need today. Believe it or not, you know, even though the idea might be new, what you're building might be new, the need is not, right? So everyone would have figured out some way to crack the coconut. Mm -hmm. It may not be the most elegant way. It may not be the easiest way. They are still probably experiencing pain, but they would have solved for it in some way or form. So understand what it is that they have, because what you need to be building is something that makes it better, right? So understanding that and capturing those is going to be very, very important and useful, as we'll see later on when we define the product, um, that these anecdotes are very, very powerful. So one example for what um, this could look like is, um, you know, where you're saying data engineers, uh, there are one customer segments, let's say the others being data scientists or data product owners, data analytics, so it could be any number. So for the data quality tool um, that we talked about, data engineers are one customer segment. So they run offline checks. Offline is a key word here. They don't have anything that captures this in, in real time. Um, and they do this by just sampling data. They don't check every single data packet that passes, passes through their pipeline. And their challenge is that they um, don't have an embedded quality checker, which checks this and alerts them in a timely manner. So you have captured this as one problem statement for this customer segment. And the other aspect that you can capture at this stage for your idea is, uh, you know, define a goal. And as you define a goal, you're setting out something for yourself, your team, what you're going to achieve. And how do you measure that achievement? How do you measure that goal is equally important, right? So when you say, um, for example, um, we'll have X number of successful true positives when we run these quality checks um, out of Y uh, number of you know, data packets. Um, and we would detect this in N seconds. So this kind of captures the, of course, is a very high level goal. This uh, could be broken down into multiple measures, success metrics. Um, but what is important is that you know, what you have said about, there is a way by which, you know, you can measure the success as part of, you know, defining this goal and putting this in that space for your idea. Mm -hmm. You're also saying how you're going to measure this, a framework for how you're going to measure this and a space, that space can also be used to share those metrics. And you can review that periodically to see if there is any improvement that can be made. Again, everything goes into that space for um, that you have set out and you have brought all of these aspects of your idea out in the open. Right. So now that we have defined all of this, so your idea is out in the wild now, so it's no longer just within your head. At this stage, it feels magical. Right. So you're getting more and more confident. You're basically you're, you're talking to real people who are struggling and you know in your mind that you can make a difference. You can make an impact for them. So you get very excited. Your idea is out in the open and it's not just you who's feeling good about it. The others are excited about it as well. Um, so you feel better when you think about it. This is real feeling. So this is, you know, this is euphoria, I'll tell you. So when you get to this stage. And you're constantly thinking about it, and it makes you better. So at this point, what you want to do is build mass around this idea, right? So now we've brought that into open, so you have to make that real. So add more substance and, and weight to, to that idea. Let's see how we can do that. So first step is go and do your product survey, right? Like I said, the need is not new. There may have been many people who have sold it in a thousand different ways. So it's very important for you to identify and understand how this has been done so that you, know, you can incorporate all of that idea. And then we'll come to the next stage of where you're identifying what is unique about the, the product itself that you have come up with. Right. So 
at this stage, you come up with a product comparison matrix is a very good uh, you know, mechanism that you can use to collate the survey um, information. For example, you list the features based on, you know, the customer conversations that you have had, the engagements you have had, you come up with like a set of features um, and you start to score them, you weigh them and you debate what the pros and cons are, what the feature maturity is, how ready is your uh, or, or these products that are out in the market. And this could be an external tool, it could be an internal product that's already there within your organization, it could be an open source tool that's there, um, or it could be a vendor uh, who's doing this, or there could be a startup who's just building this product. So go out and do this product survey and collate all this information. So this could be something that looks like this. It's a you know, um, no, not a real example, but this is what a matrix would um, would look like. And based on the customer conversations, you know exactly what is important for your customers, your customer segments, so you can weigh and score them. One of these products should be your own idea. So your idea, what does this solve for and where does this score? What, where do you need to improve and what do you need to add? So that is an important um, input for how you build up build up this um, product idea. So the next step is identifying the USP. Like USP here means unique selling point for your product. If there is a product that already solves for it, then I would question why you're building it, right? Go and buy it or go and explore using that or do a POC for it instead of building something from scratch that's already been sold because all your effort and resource could be better utilized somewhere else. And that's more efficient as well. So doing this market analysis is going to help you answer a lot of questions around buy versus build later on. And these questions would come when you go and ask for more money or ask for more people to, to work on this project. So it's very important to do all these preliminary work uh, before you get to that point. So what was the USB in our case was our product was the only one which was near real time. Again, speaking to those customers, this means something to them, right? In the anecdote, we saw that they were running offline checks on a sample of data, nothing that alerted them in near real time as soon as something happened. So um, ours was the only near real time because we were using streaming data, which provided us with that low latency um, uh, observability. And we were the only one that provided that capability to run checks on both data in motion and at rest. So a lot of products that sold for um, batch or landed data in Data Lake, but not many and none at all, I'd, I'd even say um, at that stage that sold for um, uh, streaming data, data that was in Kafka streams or any other stream solution. So this was the unique selling point for our product. And this was the main reason why we were not able to leverage any of the products that were out there. So equipped with all of that analysis and you know the conversations that you have had with the customers, now we define what the product is. So this product definition is going to be used uh, many times over as you talk to your stakeholders, as you talk to, you know, potential hires for your team or for your customers when you talk to con talk in conferences or in community. So you need to be able to define what your product does. And this is where the anecdotes that you had gathered is going to be super helpful. So use this to tell a story of what your product solves for what um, if you can add uh, information about you know uh, how much money this could potentially say what business impact it can have um, for your organization then all the better right so you can enrich this product definition more and more but it's very important that it tells a story of what it's doing right so at this stage this idea is going to need constant attention and feeding, right? As it gains more attention, it starts to transform itself into something more concrete, a plan. You need a roadmap. 
So again, the roadmap needs to tell a story. So in this case, it needs to um, you know, talk about what the customer need is. You list the features. Um, it could be you know, a sprint level roadmap. It could be a quarterly roadmap, whatever works for you and your organization. But it's important to uh, set out at each milestone, what is your product delivering for what customers, right? So again, leverage a lot from the customer conversations. What is your customer getting at each of this stage? Which particular ask or need is your uh, tool or product gonna solve? When you actually uh, you know, finish off that quarter one, I will have some level of you know, manual checks that can be run. It's not gonna be self-serve. So if there is a customer who needs a completely hands-off um, uh, sorry, the opposite. So if they want to kind of configure these checks and do all kinds of fancy stuff, they're not going to get that at that quarter. But it kind of sets out um, an, an idea of where they can, you know, get that their feature that is important to them. If they have more pressing need for streaming quality checks, okay, I'm going to get that at the end of the quarter, second quarter. And this is also a good tool that you can share to, uh, you know, executives and, and other stakeholders, as well as your customers and team as well. Um, this was quite helpful for us to early on identify which, how we can face the product rollout. Um, and we went with, uh, because this was pretty much a greenfield um, project. So we started with a POC on alpha stage where you're just trying out your idea. You're not overly bothered about adding a lot of features. You just want to show the feasibility. You want to show the functionality, just prove that this is possible. Um, Again, this gives a lot of uh, confidence in your product for yourself, your team, and others as well. The second phase moving on is, is beta. Uh, a quick definition for that is, you know, you go and talk to some early adopters, people who have um, immediate need, they have something temporary in place, but they are willing to test and try out and is curious about your, your idea. Um, and you can test the stability um, while you're doing it with those early adopters. At this stage, it's very natural to have teething uh, problems and you're probably reacting to those problems. Um, and you're also starting to think about, you know, scaling. What problems are you going to run into when you scale this? Uh, and all your decisions are going to be based on, uh, you know, thinking about the scale. And you can add a few more features in there. Um, and start to expand the, the product pro, uh, feature set. The next stage is the MVP. Obviously, this is a, a scaled version of what you initially set out as the MVP scope. Um, this should be, at this stage, the product should be usable by a variety and um, scale of users from a small team to you know, a, a team of um, multiple data products, um, a large number of users who can uh, onboard and test it, a variety of data sets um, that you want to try it out with. Um, at this stage, the expectation is your product is reliable and production ready for all the features that were in the MVP scope. The next one is the final GA, which is generally available. Um, at this stage, the product is available to everyone, all kinds of users that you initially set out um, to solve for in your product definition, in your uh, goals, whatever you have defined early on. Um, it's stable for future development as well. Uh, adoption rates are higher. It's automated. It's self-serve. There is uh, support available, the on-call support and documentations are complete. Um, it's end-to-end, -end, you know, functional and uh, fully scaled. So, uh, as I mentioned in the previous one, one important call out here is, uh, you know, identifying the early adopters. And again, you'll start to get a feel of those based on the customer conversations that you have had before. Um, when you're identifying the early adopters, it's important to pick people who have big business impact um, can show big value when they use your product, but they're less critical. So you're not in the critical part for something that's being rolled out for your organization. But at the same time, it makes a big difference. 
So one example is, um, you know, like a third party marketing data just used for calculating marketing spend. This has been in the organization for years and years. So there's always like a fallback option. There are some uh, checks that are being run today. So you're not in the critical path. But once you have put this here, the uh, you know the checks and the alerts that you get out of your own product can make a massive difference and it can be validated against you know how much your organization is spend, spending on um, you know marketing and how you're highlighting any missing data while doing this so this can show a big big difference and marketing is always very very important to any organization so you know that's a very good uh, place to look for early adopters if you want to show how winning your product is Um, it's also important to gather feedback um, and gather early and frequent, reach out to people, you know, who have volunteered to be the early adopters. Again, no need to incorporate all of them immediately, um, analyze the feasibility and how applicable is it to your other customers if you have other customer segments to address. Um, but be flexible in adjusting the roadmap. So the roadmap is not set in stone. It's very important to be, um, you know, uh, flexible about how you uh, adjust and change and uh, lend yourself to, you know, changing requirements. Sometimes it might feel like an extension of your product. So, for example, um, you know, in the in the data quality examples, so what happens once you have alerted? Like, how how does one remediate this? It would be great to have an auto remediation. Um, uh, uh, tool that you know just goes and magically fixes it. While it'll be fantastic, there could be like a BPMN product that could be bought and bolted onto your own platform. So, uh, knowing that you don't have to incorporate and solve for everything is is important at this stage because it's very easy to get carried away and get the boundaries blurred and bloated. Um, so, yeah, so the other example is, um, you know, when we showed the demo, there were uh, feedback, really good feedback of how we can make the anomaly detection that we had uh, within our product be better because we have been bitten in the past about false positives. Um, but again, you know, the readiness of where your team is, where your product is very important before you can um, start to act on, on that feedback. So now, you know, you have started to roll some version of uh, your, your product out. It starts to get bigger and, um, you know, there is more requirements coming in. People are interested to talk to you about it. Um, so scaling becomes a very important part um, at this stage. And scaling is not just technical, right, as you all know. So first one is, you know, how do you resource your project? Um, think about the skills requirements at this stage. You know, you have an architecture, you know exactly what the different parts of building the product is going to be. You might need, you know, uh, UI people, like I said, for data quality and normally detection building. You need data scientists, machine learning engineers, um, software engineers. So think about what are the various different skills and how they're going to work with each other when you form a cross-functional team around your product. Um, think about the seniority. Uh, again, as you're starting to build from scratch, it's very important to uh, kind of bootstrap the product with some very senior engineers during the alpha phase, which can then be handed over to a more stable pyramid-like uh, team with uh, more junior engineers at the bottom of the pyramid and a couple of senior engineers at the top. So you can build a more sustainable team around this. Have a resource plan um, of, uh, you know, how your resources or, well, I hate to use resources, the, the name resources here, how you're going to put your engineers and, you know, testers on what features and how they're going to deliver your roadmap. So it's almost like a map of the people versus your roadmap. Right. So this resource plan is going to be very helpful when you have these conversations with, you know, executives and ask for more people um, on what you can deliver now with the people you have got to what, where you can get to with the addition of a few more um, I don't know, data scientists or a few more UI engineers or a few more uh, software engineers. 
So there are multiple parts of how you build a team that scales and sustains this product. And the first part is defining and capturing the architecture. So as part of defining this architecture, you think about what the architecture principles are you going to use. Are you going to use microservices architecture? Are you going to be asynchronous? Are you going to use event sourcing at what parts? What are your um, principles governing the scaling aspect of your architecture is? Um, it's also important to have a decision making process. You can have, uh, you know, ThoughtWorks ADR, which is the architecture decision record. Um, it's a code repository where you're capturing the rationale behind why you're making a decision, what are the different options you considered, why you finalized on a particular option, who reviewed it. So all of these are captured and versioned as part of your uh, code repo. So it's a great tool to, to use, but you can use other ways as well. But as long as there is a consistent mechanism of how your decision making process is um, happening, uh, and you do this as early as possible, because at this stage, you're going to be making a lot of decisions and down the line in three months, you'll go like, oh, why the hell did we decide to go for Kafka instead of Pulsar? And everybody will be like, oh, we don't know. Um, but that's a go to place for anybody to kind of refer to. Um, define the engineering strategies, engineering principles, what is you know, uh, because as you're going to be adding and this team is scaling with more engineers, more engineers with varied experience as well, it's very important that this is written down. Um, what does, you know, clean code mean? What is this code review process? What is the release process? What is acceptable? What is not? If you have an inner source strategy, which, you know, we wanted to desperately, but we were not ready because we we're just starting out and we didn't have the review process in place. But it's good to kind of think about these and writing those down and capturing those in that common space that you have. Um, obviously, define ways of working. What is definition of done? And, um, you know, what, what do you mean when you have when you say that you have shipped a feature? What can be expected for, for your product? Um, what is the delivery process? Are you going to use Kanban, Scrum, or Scrumban, or Can Scrum? I don't know. Um, so it could be like various versions of what, what, what it means for your team, and that could be very unique. So capture that and what that cadences are in a, in a single place. Um, this part is very important, hiring and onboarding, and commonly overlooked when a product is being built and developed. So have a hiring strategy. Where are you going to hire? What kind of, you know, on top of the seniority and the skills, um, are you going to go for, you know, vendors or contractors who are easier to come and build quickly? Or are you going to get more uh, permanent headcounts to build this? Where are they going to be placed? Are they going to be in one single location or distributed across multiple locations? How are you going to manage it? Um, what is the interview process? Uh, if you don't have a standardized process across your organization, who's going to be part of the loop? What are you going to assess them on? Um, have a standardized assessment for coding and architecture that is relevant to your product rather than a random problem solving algorithmic question. Um, and the last part is very important, like have an onboarding documentation when people are joining your team. It is very important. You can't just wing it when they turn up at your doors. Um, and having all of that in that one space, kind of, you know, you're already halfway there. Right. So at this point, once you have built the team, you have, you know, some form of the product that is already there. You want to start showing it to others. Now, depending on your comfort level, this can be quite scary. Um, but this is very, very important. As soon as you have a starter, even as soon as that alpha phase, when you are just testing out the feasibility of your product with a very bare end-to-end -end functionality, you start to share this. So the way that we did was we started to record demos with you know, even engineers speaking to the features. They were very disjointed, like the features were not with fancy UI and all the way through to the end. But again, you're just demonstrating what you had scoped for that phase, right? For example, we didn't have a UI to show uh, you know, dashboards. Um, so we used Power BI, which just pulled offline data. It didn't offer a lot of 
uh, flexibility for your customers to go and tweak what their dashboard view should be to see their trends on data quality. But it showed them what we were trying to explain, right? So as you start to bring your idea and the product out in the open more and share it with others, think about what is important for what kind of audience. Again, for example, customers record demos, share it with them widely. And again, put that in that confluence space or the wiki space for anybody to come and refer to it at any point in the product development. This also shows like, you know, a progress of what, where your product is. And it's nice to have that progress recorded um, frequently. More, make a status of, uh, you know, the features you can use like uh, traffic lights, for example, to say red, green, uh, yellow. This is where we are. This is, we are not doing this at this point. We have already completed, uh, you know, doing uh, certain checks. We don't have anomaly detection. That's a red. We don't have batch data, or we, we are in the progress of uh, in, in the process of adding batch checks. So that's a yellow. So you can use that to kind of at any stage um, flag what the status is, um, and you can have like temporary placeholders where features are missing, like for example wireframes when you don't have a UI, or you know use some third-party tooling to um, show you or share the check results. For example, um, when you don't have uh, a nice uh, looking way to report on, on the data quality checks. Um, stakeholders, so these are people, group of people or teams who have vested interest in your, uh, in your idea, in your product. And this could include executives and the CXOs. Um, so for them, what you share is, is totally different. So they wanna show you know, what difference your product is making to their business. So you want to pull those numbers out, like, you know, by uh, delivering this MVP, we have identified X number of uh, quality issues in Clickstream data uh, on time, which, you know, has saved the business like 500,000 pounds or dollars. As if you can quantify that, that'll be fantastic. Um, also, you know, share your success metrics. We talked about it at the where you were defining the goal, like how many people, how many products have you, data products have you onboarded? How many stream or data sets have you onboarded? That could be one of the success metrics, like, you know, how quickly have you identified an issue? So share all those metrics, success metrics to the executors. Um, and, you know, share the roadmap, the resource plans, all of this we have talked about, you know, or good things to start showing and demonstrating the success of your product. Um, shared in the community, right? So we talked about open sourcing and inner sourcing, but there are architecture and engineering communities within your organization, start to knowledge share, best practices, um, and uh, you know, share that information, get your team to go out and talk more about your product, evangelize that as much as you can. Um, it's also important to point out that you will get different views at this point. Skepticism and cynicism is very common. You'd get constant challenges, which is where you know, all that groundwork that we have put in um, about you know, the product survey, the market analysis is all going to come in handy, where you're constantly challenged about the why and why did we prioritize so all of that is going to pay off at this stage. So, so we have done the difficult part, almost one day your idea takes off. So it is in production. Now, it's, the job is not quite complete because once it goes into production, that is not the end of it. Um, your product, not your idea, the product is out in the wild. So it is going to be dependent, uh, depended on by other teams. They are going to rely on, on your product performing well, right? Um, so it's very important to have a good support structure in place. Think about on-call, think about how you're gonna rotate um, people in, in this on-call, how are you gonna support them? What is the standard operating procedures for various 
things that could happen when your product is out in in you know out there what if you can't read data from these data sources what is an operator do um have run books for these um you know uh for these incidents have you had all your apis documented for your customers to uh refer to some examples you know you can have like follow the sun model or 24 by 7 model have api docu documents on uh you know an open source like swagger or confluence but these things need to be there available right so that brings us to the end um i have a few takeaways pretty much just going over what we talked about so far. So when you're thinking about what you do with an idea, create a space, give it an identity, know your customers and stakeholders, what do they want? Use that to define your product. It's very important to iterate over your ideas and your product as you go on and as you get feedback, as you get more uh, input. But finally, I'd say don't get too attached. Don't get too attached to, uh, you know, dump parts of it, redo parts of it, or, you know, even at the early stage, if you have to dump the whole idea, do it. Now, that ending is very different to what the book says, um, but this is reality, right? Uh, and we are, we are professional. So I've made it a bit more pragmatic for, for this audience. Uh, so it's important not to get too attached to your, to your idea or with your product. So what does your idea do? It changes the world. Thank you.